Hey guys, my name's Kim Parker, and I go to the Walton campus with my husband Rob and our son Wesley. I grew up in a small traditional Baptist church, and from the time my sisters and I were very little, our parents taught us how to do three-part harmony, and so we would travel from one church to another, singing in our little trio uh, throughout my entire childhood. So music was a huge part of my life. It always has been. So when God brought us to Greystone about eight years ago, I completely expected that to continue. About two and a half years ago, I started leading a student small group on Wednesday nights, and I got the opportunity to start singing for their worship services. And that in turn led to an opportunity to transition into the worship team on Sunday mornings. And I was over the moon to get to do that. That was what I call my happy place. I was so excited, absolutely loved it. And I wish that I could tell you that that was the rest of my story, but it's not. Um, unfortunately, what happened next, I was not expecting, but I was overcome with jealousy. And I began looking at the people around me and comparing their voices to my voice and their opportunities to my opportunities. And I basically handed over my joy because I was so focused on what other people were doing that I didn't see what God had right in front of me. And I very clearly heard back from God and it changed everything in that moment. And what he said to me was, I gave you the voice that I created especially for you. I didn't create their voices for you, that's for them. I created this especially for you, on purpose, for a purpose. And I could have given anybody this opportunity, but I'm offering it to you. I realized that God didn't need me to be on the worship team. He didn't need me to sing. He actually doesn't need me at all, but He's inviting me to be a part of his story and how special that is and what a gift that that is. And once I grasped that, I begged him for forgiveness, for another chance to step into the calling that he had given me. I prayed for a change of heart. And then that following Sunday was completely different. I was so excited to be there. I didn't care who was in the audience or what songs were being sung or what part I was singing. It was all me and him. And I was the freest then I think I have ever been. And every Sunday since then, or every time I get to sing at all, that is my prayer is that it's not about me. That people remember the experience that they had meeting God during that time. Not that I was up on the stage um, and just how special it is that although he doesn't need us, he invites us to be a part of his story. And I just pray that he will forever keep that on my heart. What a powerful testimony. Let's give Kim a big hand. I appreciate her sharing her story and sharing her story of of experiencing God and how God invited him to, to join, invited her to join him in his work. Let me welcome our Walton campus, our Coney campus, everybody who's watching online. How do you guys enjoy the hymns? Do y'all love singing the hymns? I love that song, How Great Thou Art. That and Great Is Thy Faithfulness is probably my two favorite uh, hymns of all time. Uh, today we're diving into week three of experiencing God and we're, gonna, we're just going to jump right in. We're looking at reality uh, number three, which is God invites you to become involved with him in his work. And I'm, I'm going to repeat that because I know we have a lot of fill in the blanks. We want to make sure everybody gets the, gets the answers. This is reality number three. God invites you to become involved with him in his work. And so it's important for us to understand that the Bible is not a, not a story about a bunch, of, a bunch of individuals and how they relate to God. But the Bible is a story about God and how he relates to individuals. The Bible is about who God is and his activities throughout history. And it's through the Bible that God reveals himself and his purposes 
in his ways to us. Now, I think it's important for us to understand this, this truth that God invites us to join him in his work. Now, why is that so important? Why is it important for us to understand this truth that God invites us to join him in his work? Well, first, we get to be a part of something that's so much bigger than ourselves. We get to be a part of what God is doing around the world. We get to be, be a part of seeing lives changed for all eternity. We get to be a part of eternal significance. We, we talked about this last week, that we're not living for this life, we're living for eternity. And we're, when we're fulfilling God's purpose and His plans, we're able to invest our life in the things that last forever. We're able to invest our life into things that are significant. And over the years, I've talked to many, many people who are climbing this ladder of success only to realize that their ladder's been leaning against the wrong building. And they make this shift from instead of trying to be successful, trying to be significant. And I hope and pray that that's what's happening as we're doing the experience in God study, that we can shift our lives from trying to be successful to being significant. And so by understanding that God is at work and he wants us to join him in his work, we get to be a part of what he's doing. But secondly, it's best for us. God created us to know him. God created us to have a relationship with him. He wants us to experience his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so when we're following his will and we're doing what it is that he's called us to do, we're able to live the abundant life, the good life, the the blessed life, the highest quality of life. So understanding that he is at work and he's invited us to join him Not only are we able to be a part of what God is doing, but it's actually best for our lives as well. Can I get an amen on that? So here's some more principles from the Experiencing God study. You never find God asking people to dream up what they want to do for him. He takes the initiative. In the Bible... We never see God asking people to dream up what they want to do for him. He takes the initiative. I am so guilty of this. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever done this, but I'm a dreamer. I'm a visionary. I I, I can come up with a big dream. And I come up with this big dream and say, okay, God, you bless it. You you do it. (laughs) But we don't see that in the Bible. We don't see people in the Bible coming up with these dreams. Actually, in the Bible, we see people kind of minding their own business. (laughs) And God shows up and says, this is what I'm about to do, and this is what I want you to do. And so many times throughout the scriptures, the people that God is calling to do something are reluctant to do it. (laughs) I dream these big dreams for God. Say, God, I want you to bless my dreams. I want you to show up. And and prayer isn't trying to get God onto our agenda. Prayer should be us aligning ourselves with his will and getting onto his agenda for our lives. God invites us to join him, and then we have to adjust our lives. And sometimes there are minor adjustments and small adjustments, and sometimes it's major adjustments. Sometimes it's life-altering adjustments so that he can use us to accomplish his purposes. I don't know if this excites you, but it's exciting that God would want to use us to accomplish his purposes. Amos 3, 7 says, The sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Understanding what God is about to do where you are is more important than telling God what you want to do for him. Understanding what God is about to do where you are is more important than telling God what you want to do for him. God's in control. God is sovereign. He's not only the creator of the universe, but he is the sustainer of the universe. 
and he will fulfill his purposes and his plans. God isn't following us. (laughs) He's the leader. We are following him. And he gives us the opportunity to be a part of what he is doing. Now, what happens if he invites us to join him and we don't do it? Does that mean he doesn't fulfill his purposes? No. He still fulfills his purposes. We've just missed the opportunity to share in the blessing. We've just missed the opportunity to be a part of what he's going to use somebody else to do it. If we don't, if he, if we don't step into that, he will use somebody else to do it. God's revelation of his activity is an invitation for you to join him. God's revelation of his activity is an invitation for you to join him. So God's revelation is your invitation. When God reveals his purpose and his plans to you, he's inviting you to join him. Now, how do you know God is inviting you to join him? (laughs) But how how do you know that it's not you just coming up with the idea, but God is the one who's actually inviting you to join him. Let's go back to the example of Jesus. Remember, we're, Jesus is our model. He's our example. This passage is a big part of the experience in God's study. John, John 5, verse 17, and then 19 through 20. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only, he can only do... He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. And so Jesus is watching. And he's looking to see where is God at work? Where is God moving? What is God doing? What is he up to? And how can I be a part of it? How does he want me to join him? Now, the the key word there is watch, is watching, watching to see what God is doing. Where is he working? What is God doing, and how can we join him? I've been trying to share practical illustrations of these principles every week. Uh, One of them I want to share with you today is the opportunity we had as a church to join God's work with Compassion International around the world. And I have to be honest with you, when when God was calling us to do it, I didn't see it at first. (laughs) It took took a while for me to see that God was moving and that God was inviting us to be a part of what he was doing. And so we would be at a Catalyst Conference. All of our staff would be at Catalyst Conference. There would be testimonies about Compassion International. They would pass out the packets I was like, well, we're, we're already supporting the kids in Haiti. We support a couple hundred kids in Haiti. You know, I don't, I don't think we should do that. And then I would have pastor friends call me and invite me to go on a trip. Hey, we're going with Compassion International to, to Africa. I'd love for you to come with us. Compassion is going to pay for it. They just want you to see the, see the work. And I would always say, I don't have time to go to Africa. I mean, Africa is a whole other continent, right? <laughs> I mean, we, don't, we don't have time to go there. Or they would invite me to go down to South America. It's like, well, we already go to Brazil. We're already there, and we're supporting the kids in, the kids in Haiti. Compassion International would send me emails. If you guys knew how many emails I get every week wanting Greystone Church to partner with a certain ministry or support a certain ministry, it's hundreds, hundreds of emails throughout the year. And I wouldn't read the emails. I'd just delete them. They would call the church for me. I wouldn't return the calls. And then when, when Jennifer became involved in missions and the, and the Compassion International reached out to her and they, they really wanted us to go to Africa. They wanted us to go to Ethiopia and to, to Kenya. And we finally felt, okay, God is, is opening this door. He's opening the opportunity. We ought to go and check it out. And when we get over there, it's amazing the work that God is doing. Extreme poverty. And we met the kids. I have a picture here of us with the kids. 
We met all of these kids. We went into their houses. We saw how poor they were. And Compassion International, the, the mission, is releasing kids from poverty in the name of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's very gospel-centered. Yes, they meet their physical needs with food and clothing and, and education. But most importantly, these kids are hearing the gospel every single time they come to the church, every single time they come to the, the project. And our translators that week in Ethiopia were actually kids that grew up as compassion kids, and they graduated high school, and they went to college, and now they have careers. And we saw the process. We saw how someone could go from extreme poverty through the name of Jesus, their whole lives could be changed. We thought, well, God is at work here. God is moving. We were so impressed with, with compassion. And uh, so we're like, we, we want to be a part of this. But we thought, to go to Africa, that's a long way. And people from our church flying to Africa and the cost of that. And, and so they share with us about Honduras and the opportunity in Honduras. And there's this, there's this village, there's this, this city in Honduras that's been wanting a project for years and hasn't had the support for one. And we thought, wow, Honduras, they speak Spanish. That's my second best language, right? <laughs> I know a little Spanish. It's a three-hour flight from Atlanta. Like, we could get on a plane and be there in three hours. And we presented it to the church that the God is at, at work. And our church responded with incredible generosity like our church always does. But we were able to sponsor over 680 kids. I mean, that is incredible. If you do the math on that... That's well over $300,000 a year that's going to the least of these and to the, to the poor. And we had an opportunity uh, to visit the project a couple of weeks ago. And I just wanted you to see some of the pictures and some of the faces and the work that's being done there. I, we share with the pastor, the project director, that we're just getting started. Like This is just the beginning of investing into these kids and into the church there. And so I wanted you guys just to see a video. Some of you may support some of these kids. Maybe you'll see your child on the screen.
Those kids key or what? Huh? That, I'll tell y'all a story, that little kid with the minion shirt on. He really liked Jolin's camera and everything, and he kind of followed Jolin around. And so what part of the party there for the service, uh, we had a pinata. And so, you know, they were, they were whacking the, the pinata. And as soon as the candy would fall, all the kids would run out, and they would keep, like, swinging the stick, you know, so you thought a kid was going to get hit over the head with the, with the stick. And finally, the pastor of the church comes out, and he um, opens up the pinata, and it falls. Well, Minion, he was the first one into the candy, and they all completely dogpiled him. And uh, Jolin has this, this video of him kind of coming out from the bottom of the pile with, like, tears coming down his eyes. It, it was hilarious. I know it's not funny, but it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> but he had the most candy, <laughs> right? And, uh, I mean, he was worn out by the time the, the day was over. But I want you to, I'm so proud of our church. And it's not about us, right? It's about God. But I, I think this is one of the most significant things that we've ever done. Because these kids, 680 kids are going to hear the gospel every single time they go to the church. They have a relationship with the pastor. They have a relationship with the project director. When we send our money for a birthday present or a Christmas gift, we don't just send the money to the family. The project director takes the mom and the child to the store and buys everything. You know, There's a lot of accountability there. And to think about 680-something lives being changed for all eternity. And the relationship that we can build with them. We're not just sending money. We're writing letters. We're going to visit them. We have a mission trip going to Honduras uh, this summer. In fact, we're having a meeting today. For anyone interested in any of our mission trips, Honduras, Brazil, Scotland, there, there's a meeting today. Talk about significance. Moving from success to significance. You cannot know the activity of God unless he takes the initiative to reveal it to you. When God reveals what he is doing, it's an opportunity, it's an invitation to respond. When God speaks, he's ready to accomplish his purposes. And I think it's so important for us to to understand this. Because when God speaks, he says he's going to do it. But he doesn't say when he's going to do it. Now, when he speaks, we need to adjust our lives immediately. We need to take on a posture of obedience. But it doesn't mean he's going to answer the promise immediately. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Catch you what I'm throwing? In our our study this week, we looked at Abraham and Sarah. Do you remember the story of Abraham and Sarah? And God comes to Abraham and Sarah and says, I'm going to bless you with a son. I'm going to bless you with a child. And you're going to become the father of a nation, my nation. And you remember what happens? Sarah laughs because she's in her old age and Abraham's in his old age and they're unable to have kids. But God gives them the promise. And when God says he's going to do something, he will do it. But he doesn't always do it on our timetable. (laughs) So they got impatient. They took matters into their own hands. And Sarah says, well, I'm not able to give birth to a child, but but, but our maidservant Hagar Hagar could. Why don't you go and have relations with Hagar? And then she gives birth to Ishmael. But he wasn't the seed of the promise. They didn't wait on God. Do you know how many years from the, from the time that God made the promise to the time Isaac was born? 25 years. They waited 25 years for the promise. If God says he will do it, he's going to do it. But he doesn't always do it on our timetable. It's hard to be patient, isn't it? Isn't it hard to wait on the Lord? Like we have all of these promises from Scripture and we know He's spoken into our lives and we're waiting 
Sometimes we have to wait 25 years. I want you to jot this down. I don't have it in my notes, but this is the takeaway for today. If God says he will do it, adjust your life to it. If God says he will do it, adjust your life to it. Go ahead and adjust your life. Go ahead and take a posture of obedience. It may not happen this year. It may not happen next year. It may not happen five years from now. But you've adjusted your life. You've stepped out in faith. You've taken on a posture of obedience. And in God's timing and in his perfect will, he will fulfill the promise. If God says he will do it, adjust your life to it. Right then, immediate obedience. I love our stories of spontaneous baptism. Over the years, we've had people, you know, in the clothes that they wore to church, immediately obey God. I was talking with a couple ladies at our Walton campus over the weekend, and I'd heard their stories of spontaneous baptism immediately obeying what God is calling us to do, adjusting our lives, even if it's not comfortable. If God calls you to go on a mission trip and maybe God's speaking to you and said, I want to go to Honduras and I want to meet my child, then just go. Adjust your life to it. Ask off work. Figure it out. Or let God figure it out. You adjust your life. You be obedient to what God's called you to do. And let him take care of the details. If God lays an old friend on your heart and you hadn't talked to this person in in years, is that not God's invitation for you to reach out to him or her? Why Why else is he putting this person on your heart? You never know what God's up to. If he says he'll do it, adjust your life to it. Isaiah 46, 11 says, what I have said, that I'll bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. If God says that he's going to do something, he's going to do it. (laughs) Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not Fulfill? If God promises that he's going to do it, it's as good as done. We just have to wait on his perfect timing. Amen? There are some things that only God can do. And when you see one of these things happening, you can know that God is at work. There are some things that only God can do. We can't do them. And when you see one of these things happening, you know that God's at work. God draws people to himself. We cannot change someone's life. (laughs) We can share the gospel with them. We can love them. We can invite them to church. We can invite them to small group. We can reach out to them. But we cannot go inside of someone's life and inside of someone's heart, inside of someone's soul and change their lives. God is the one who does the changing. And so if you see God drawing someone to himself, then God is at work and he may want to use you as part of the process. God calls his people to seek after him. God's the one that gives, he's the one who gives us the desire to know him. Deep down, we don't have this desire. We're all sinful. We've all gone astray. We're all, you know, selfish. <laughs> we can encourage people to read the Bible. We can encourage people to, to read the Experience in God workbook. We can challenge people to get in a small group. We can ask people to come to church. We, we can do all of these things. But only God causes people to seek after him. He has to be working in their lives. Because naturally, no one is going to come to Christ. 
He draws them. He causes people to seek after him. God reveals spiritual truth. Before I came to know Christ, I would read the Bible and I had no idea what it meant. I would sit in church Sunday after Sunday and it was like I had blinders on my eyes and and I couldn't understand anything. But when I came to know Christ and the Holy Spirit's inside of me, then all of a sudden, the Word of God comes alive. And it's His Holy Spirit that illuminates, that reveals truth to us. And if you know that God is revealing truth to you or truth to someone else, you know that He's at work. It's His Word that is the truth. I think we make the mistake of so many times of listening to other people instead of listening to God. He is the truth. He gives us the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. God convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. It's not our job to convict other people of their sins. It's not our role. It's the Holy Spirit's role to convict someone of his or her sin. And so if if someone is being convicted of sin, you know that God is at work in his or her life. All of these things, when you see one or more of these things happening, you know that God is at work. When you see someone coming to faith and getting baptized, God is at work. When you see someone reading the Bible and it's jumping off the page and it's coming alive in his or her life, you know God is at work. When someone is being convicted of his or her sin and they're repenting of that sin, you know that God is at work in their lives. So I want us us to, to close here and look at the story of Jesus. And it's Jesus' interaction was Zacchaeus. And a lot of us know the story of Zacchaeus. I'm going to read it. But as I'm reading, I want you to think about the experience in God principles. Think about how God is at work and how Jesus is, is looking to see where God is moving and where is God working and how is God inviting Jesus to join him in his work. Okay? We're in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 and following. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So Jesus is just passing through Jericho. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector and was wealthy. Now, it's interesting that Luke mentions that he was wealthy. And remember, Jesus said that it... That it uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. So I think that's why I mentioned it. He wanted to see who Jesus was, because, but because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead of the crowd and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, when Jennifer and I were in the Holy Land and we were driving through Jericho, there was a place that they said, this is the sycamore fig tree that Zacchaeus was in. And I was so skeptical of that. (laughs) I said, how do they know (laughs) this is the actual sycamore fig tree that Zacchaeus was in? I don't think that was the exact tree, but it it was a, you know, it's a famous site. You can buy a T-shirt. It was one of those trees, right? (laughs) Take a picture. Here's the tree. When Jesus reached the spot, listen to this. He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to stay at your house today. And he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Remember the tax collectors were the worst of sinners, right? And you weren't supposed to spend time with sinners. 
But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And so we see his repentant heart. We see he's being convicted of sin, that God is drawing him to himself. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So do you see the realities of experiencing God? Jesus is walking through the crowd. He's walking through Jericho. He's praying. He's looking to see where is God moving and where is God working. And he looks up and sees this guy that wants to see him so bad that he's climbed to the top of this tree just to get a view of Jesus. And so Jesus thinks, God must be working in this person's life. This, this guy wants to see me so bad that he's climbed a tree. And he invites him down. He spends the day with him. He joins God in his work. And salvation comes to Zacchaeus. Do you, you see the pattern? Do you, you see how God was at work? He invited Jesus to be a part of it, and God used Jesus to bring salvation to Zacchaeus. So let's look at some practical things. When you want to know what God is doing around you, number one, pray and watch to see what God does next. How often do we pray and then we forget about it? But pray expecting that God's going to answer the prayer. So we need to pray and watch what he does next. Number two is make the connection between your prayer and what happens next. We're praying, we're watching, and then we need to recognize and make the connection between our prayer and what happens next. Uh, Jen Jennifer uh, went to the hospital yesterday to, to visit someone whose father was in the hospital. But she prayed, God, of course she was going to visit them and pray with them, but is there another reason why I'm supposed to be at the hospital? And so she's sitting in the waiting room, and someone that she doesn't know comes up to her and says, are, are you uh, the pastor's wife at Greystone? And she says, yes. And this, they have a mutual friend, and, and she, something had happened. And, and so she had an opportunity to pray with this person as well. So you pray, okay, why am I going to the hospital? There may be another reason. And then we, we make the connection between our, between our prayer and what happens next. Find out what God is already doing. Where is God already working? What, what is he already doing? Number four, ask probing questions. And this is something we can do with our, with our friends. This is something we can do with our kids. How can I pray for you? What's the most significant thing that's happening in your life right now? Has, has God laid any burdens on your, on your heart? What's God doing in your life? What's God doing in your small group? What, what's God doing in your church? And then number five, we listen. We ask people questions, and then we listen for their responses. And maybe God will reveal his plan to us. Maybe he will reveal what he's doing in someone's life. And remember, his revelation is our invitation. Right? Don't just talk to God in your prayers. Listen to him. What is he saying to you? And then number six is be ready to make the necessary adjustments in order to join God in what he is doing. So here's the memorable takeaway. If God says he will do it, adjust your life to it. Can, can we say that together? If God says he will do it, adjust your life to it. So God is at work. God is moving. We're watching to see where, he's at, where is he at work? Where is he moving? Throughout the day, we're at work, we're at school, we're in the neighborhood, we're at the ballpark. Where, where is God moving? What is he doing. And as he reveals 
his purpose and his plan to us, it's our invitation to join him. And if he says he will do it, we need to adjust our lives to it. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for your good, pleasing, and perfect will. I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be a part of something that's so much bigger than ourselves, to be a part of your work in our community and around the world, to be a part of what you are doing for all eternity. And what we do in this life when we give our lives to the things of God and the word of God and towards the souls of men and women and students and children, we know that we're making investments in heaven. God, I pray for each of us to to make that adjustment in our lives from success to significance. And I pray, God, that we would watch. We would see where you are moving, and we would join you. And we need to realize that it's not lightning striking from heaven, but it's just simple little things every day. God, thank you for allowing us to be a part of your purposes and your plans. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.